for those of you not quite sure what this is about, let, let me just give you a very quick overview and then we'll just go to highlight a few cities where this has been happening. Great. The, the, the vision is that the Christian community operating as a network of networks becomes so strategically coordinated and coordinated that it plays a significant role in the recovery of, of, of your city and your place. Can we together over the next uh, three to five years play that kind of role? And uh, uh, that's the challenge we have. So the idea really is that, you know, the cogs connect and we bring together as many churches, charities and networks as possible across your place. That's the idea. Um, the network of networks connects better, supporting each other, responding to needs, finding gaps. That's, that's what this really is about in terms of its outcomes. Um, the idea really is also that just have one phone number, um, you know, one website, one social media presence, so that together we, we can become more than the sum of our parts. Um, when, when the church operates isolated and individually, we all do great stuff, but, but nobody knows what we do because we're not actually coordinated together. I think this is also going forward a big conversation about the future of your city or your town. And it's certainly an engagement vehicle for the public, the private and third sector. And, and I think one of the prizes will become is that actually money will start to come down. And that's already begun in some places already. When we get ourselves organized, we are a, a force for good that people want to get behind. So, um, so the vision is for a widest possible network of networks. And this is about churches, charities. Um, it's about denominations coming on board, networks of churches, prayer networks, Christians in their neighborhoods. Movement for Recovery isn't just an institutional response. It's, it's about just being a good neighbor, isn't it? It's uh, about looking out for the mental health for your, the people you live nearby or the people you work with. Um, so this, this is really a movement. It's, it's, uh, uh, it does have an institutional side to it, but it, it, it will only really operate if as Christians together, we take responsibility. Then it's an engagement vehicle. So, you know, as the council, housing, business, police, health, social care, uh, voluntary sector, other faith groups begin to, to highlight, um, you know, what needs to be done, we're engaging in that, in that conversation. We're, we're engaging in it. We're adding to that conversation and, um, and we are listening in that conversation as well. Then I think it's a delivery vehicle because as Andy and Marvin have said, you know, once we identify some priorities, can, you know, this working together model, this movement for recovery model, really harness the incredible ministries and people and volunteers and uh, buildings to actually meet the needs of the city? Can we do that? And uh, now that, that doesn't mean that we necessarily stop what we're doing, but it does mean that we may need to refocus sometimes what we're doing. So it's a delivery vehicle. And then, of course, it's a support structure for each other. You know, we're, we're not in this alone. We're standing together. We're sharing best practice with each other. Um, we're the body of Christ. We were meant to work together. That was the whole idea. That's what Jesus prayed for. Um, we're here to build relationships, make friends. Uh, friends. Friendships will change the day in your city. We, we're here to identify the gaps, find out where, where stuff really isn't happening. We're here to eliminate duplication. You know, if, you, if you've got three food banks in the same street, um, don't have three food banks in the same street or the same area. Just have one. Um, avoid the duplication. And then the other two can, you know, move on to some other priorities. And let's pray for each other. This is about seeking God and the power of his spirit. This isn't about human effort at the end of the day. And then it's about a big conversation and we're going to be developing this much more going forward. What sort of city do we actually want to live in? And then the values which undergird this. We're listening to God for our city. God knows our cities better than we do, our towns better than we do, our villages better than we do. We're listening to them um, as to what is really, what is the pain of the place that you're in at the moment? What is the pain of it? And we're meant to be there where people are hurting. We, we emphasize core unity values, honor, respect, love. We, we live out prophetically how we want our city to, to behave. This is about every ministry flourishing. This isn't a competitive thing. This is about bringing your piece to the jigsaw and seeing it as part of the bigger piece. It's a working smarter, not necessarily harder. And I know, I know there's a big issue around um, people's resilience at the moment. Church leaders are very tired and trying to just get things going and keep things going. Um, I think this is about working smarter together, you know, you know du not duplicating, but actually getting support from each other, doing things together. Each place is unique and we are a movement. 
But let's rather than me talk about this, let's uh, just bring in a few voices to talk about this. Um, I'm going to go over to Bath and uh, Peter Hayward down there. Um, Peter, in two minutes, can you describe what on earth you've been doing and how you're responding to the recovery? Thanks, Roger. That's great. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, before the pandemic, um, we launched something called Compassionate Community. Um, and we're, so we're in a relatively small city and small area. But the purpose of it uh, is to encourage people to help people in our communities. This wasn't just a church thing. It was across, across all the different sectors. Uh, the, the following month, the pandemic hit. Um, and so we put out a social media post saying we need volunteers uh, in order to help deliver food and medicines. And we got to over 2000 volunteers over a weekend. So we then had a big job to do, uh, which was to, to work out how to organize them all and sort of set up the, the, the way that the, the response mechanisms work and the insurance and all of that. And then also to set up a central hotline phone uh, for, for people to call. And uh, we've had about 5,000 calls for, for help over the, over the last year and a half. Um, and with each of them, we've triaged them and then referred out to about eight organizations who have provided help to them. Um, the remarkable thing is that this is the public sector and the private sector and charities and the council and health service and everyone working together rather than working separately, which is what Roger's just been talking about. So now as we're emerging from the pandemic, then we're going back to our original purpose. We're keeping that emergency response, but we're doing the network of networks, which is what Roger was just talking about. This is the movement for recovery bit. And there are unmet needs in our communities. And our principle is to find out what those unmet needs are, then to bring together our networks. So we've got the charities network, churches, students, businesses, council and health. And as all of those different networks come together in order to say, what are these unmet needs? How can we create multi-sector solutions? That's where we're working forwards to now in order to get new solutions to help people who are in need without costing a lot more to the council in, in the process. Um, and so that's our, that's our purpose in Compassionate Community, bringing together individuals, bringing together organizations and bringing together networks to help people help people in our communities. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Peter. That was a, a very quick overview. Thank you so much. Great stuff happening there. Let's go over to Nottingham and uh, Hannah. And uh, uh, Hannah, can you can you describe what you're doing in two minutes? I don't think you can, but uh, <laughs> give it a go. Give it a go. I'll do it. I'll talk. I always talk really fast anyway, so I'll just go really fast. Um, yeah. So in Nottingham, we for long for the last few years, we've had a couple of kind of big Christian networks. One focused on prayer, bringing together church leaders and one Christian Action Nottingham, which is what I help coordinate, bringing together Christians leading social action and community projects. We started meeting in the last recession. Um, so when COVID hit, actually, we already had a lot of relationships in place, kind of amongst ourselves and with local authorities in our boroughs um, and with other organisations. And um, as well as in Nottingham, we've helped start three similar networks in other parts of the county, bringing together people leading social action, Christians, community projects. Um, we gather those leading, the projects together around particular issues. So um, all the churches going into local prisons, getting together, those working with refugees and asylum seekers getting together. And we want those wanting to develop longer term housing, finding Christian landlords together. And people will often seek out our network. Um, for example, the council community cohesion team emailed us recently um, needing help to settle Afghans in the area. Um, the NHS bereavement team um, and some hospices asked us to be part of looking at how churches might expand and do grief cafes. Um, or also we have churches coming towards us saying, you know, we haven't been involved in our social action before, what can we do to serve the city? Um, then last year, um, we just started to feel a bit like, uh, it's great what's going on, but we're reacting, we're responding to everything, we're not being particularly strategic. And we also have been wanting to find ways for the prayer and social action networks to feel more like a team rather than, um, you know, we operate really well alongside each other, but we want to be, do more than that and be in total unity. So through Movement for Recovery, we started to grapple a little bit more with what it could look like for us to establish this network of networks that keeps being talked about. Um, for us here, there's so much in place already. Um, and I, I was worried about how much work extra it was going to be. I feel like I'm 
you know, I've got a lot on my plate already. But actually for us, you know, we've come to the point of this is God, that God is in this and it's not about us doing more. You know, it really is about us working together and effectively being just more of a team in the city. So we got down on paper all the different connections that we've got, who is in which partnership on which partnership board already, who's in which subgroup. We're meeting with our local authority lead and the chief exec in early September. Uh, but we've already been kind of building relationship and having meetings with lots of different people in the council and other organizations and then um, rather than one thing basically we're looking at how do we use our existing coordinated approach um, to increase our capacity and help the council meet their key areas of need so we, we might start something new down the line but right now um it's about actually the fact is what we're doing already that's most of the offer it's just that people haven't grasped the breadth, breadth of it um, within the council and with other organizations so it's partly about just getting out there what we're doing already and then growing it but using our kind of existing infrastructure that's hannah it. that's brilliant thank you you guys are doing so much we've learned so much from you thank you we're going to go down to basingstoke and and uh to peter hay peter tell us how, how what what your thoughts are about this and what you guys have started um yeah, I'm delighted to uh, just be part of all of this, really. We feel like we're a bit of newbies to uh, some of this in terms of the level of coordination. Um, but we have been responding a lot, uh, both in terms of food, as uh, the food poverty challenges, um, to some of the mental health challenges, as well as the homelessness uh, side of things. But uh, Movement for Recovery uh, is helping just to galvanise um, a new strategic way of actually looking to address this. Um, so we're actually going to call ourselves Basingstoke Movement for Recovery. Uh, we also have the unity movement, church unity movement called One Church. Um, but one of the things that we've been reflecting on particularly recently is looking at the town's COVID recovery strategy is very, uh, seems very much more business recovery focused. Um, and we want to support that absolutely. Um, but we also want to play a key role in terms of helping to inspire and enable a community recovery plan that's um, seeking to, I guess, see a generational improvement in health and well-being at a time when uh, there's a lot of negative negativity about how challenged that's going to be. Um, so we're looking to, uh, and just working at the moment on gathering elected local councillors, um, the voluntary sector, business leaders, church leaders to build on the work that's already been done, the credibility that's already been established with our local council, but to be more coordinated and strategic, uh, to survey what's already going on and how we can bring it better together. Um, but also we're just very conscious um, of Simon Barrington's helpful work about uh, focused on recovery before rebuilding. And the fact that not just our church leaders um, but the many in the health, social care, education are particularly weary, uh, needing support, emotional, mental health themselves. Um, we're also losing a few of uh, key people moving on to other places at the moment. So very conscious that we need to practice um, recovery ourselves um, and helping our groups and our volunteers to practice that so that we pace ourselves well, not overload, but also um, bring um to others the whole idea of recovery um and enabling recovery from actually having practiced it well ourselves so that's where we're at at the moment so andy can you tell us how things are developing there yeah no it's uh, it's a privilege to be able to work with with marvin uh he he's quite a guy known him quite a while he's been mayor now for five years he's just started his second term of three years uh and right at the beginning of that process of becoming mayor, he, he really much opened the door for the church to connect. There's a good, was, well, there was already a good degree of unity across the, the, the church community in the city, but the opportunity that Marvin gave his, his offer and asked, you know, if the church uh, is able to offer support to the city, then, then go and knock on his door uh, and ask for, for what you need from the council and other partners to be able to deliver. And we did that. We listened to Marvin. We, we went along to understand what the issues were and made offers um, and um, uh, over the last five years we've done that obviously with the pandemic um, the, the, the priorities changed to a degree so at the beginning of the pandemic we sat down with Marvin again um, uh, virtually of course because of social distancing uh, and we 
revisited what the priorities were and over the last 18 months we focused on a number of issues food insecurity is a common theme that most towns and cities have faced and we've been able to to build on the foundations that all have been put in place uh, over the previous years uh, and really upscale significantly bringing the whole city together with church at the core of it you meant he mentioned on on the call earlier that the need for emergency foster carers we had 70 foster carers who were um, over 65 and therefore had to self-isolate uh, and the church responded remarkably um, over a very short period of time to that call and contributed significantly just blew the council away they were absolutely extraordinarily amazed by the ability the church had to, to respond to that um, also around child welfare mental health and well-being again a common theme Andy and, and Marvin mentioned that uh, and we put programs in place to support vulnerable children um, um, where we partner with Transforming Life for Good, similarly with uh, mental health and well-being and digital exclusion. Going forward, um, Roger, we've got uh, very much a plan that, that we're working with Marvin and others in the city to develop, um, continuing to su support those in crisis, but also ensuring that we're contributing to those bigger needs of, of housing and homelessness, uh, and also um, work creation and employability. Uh, but also working around some of those personal uh, challenges of mental health and well-being uh, for children, for, for adolescents and for others. Um, and, um, uh, and those that are, um, uh, you know, impoverished in terms of isolation. So, so big programs uh, in place, uh, but the opportunity to work uh, with Marvin uh, as a Christian mayor has, has been remarkable. Um, obviously, we have to deliver. Um, uh, church, um, I guess, over the past has perhaps been viewed a little bit as, as well-meaning amateurs, but we've had to up our game. Uh, and um, I think as long as we're able to, to deliver and deliver well and honor God in what we're doing, uh, then I, I think that we have a real future contribution to make. And for us, just to finish, the, the, I guess the overriding um, um, desire is, is to is to honour some of those key scriptures. One of them for Bristol has been Jeremiah twenty nine seven, uh, you know, where we're saying you know to seek the peace and prosperity of the city, uh, and we're really seeking to do that. And interestingly, that verse goes on to say, and, and, and as you see, as you seek as the city prospers, so you too will prosper. There's a sense, I think, the future of the church and the city is at stake here. As we seek to bless the city, then the church itself will be blessed and will thrive, not to survive, but thrive. So I think this is a, a huge opportunity to church become to become relevant and connected again. Thanks, Andy. That's brilliant. Let's let's go over to Sean in Lincoln. Um, Sean, you've been pulling together the uh, churches together in social action for some time. Um, tell us how, how things are developing. Yeah, so for a number of years, we've been connecting as churches. So when COVID hit, we already had a bit of a safety net for the many vulnerable in our city. Um, and we, we've always had this sense that God's got a unique blueprint for our city. And I think he has for every town and city. It's never going to look the same, is it, across the board? Um, but there's just this sense that he wants to use the resource of his church to, to see this blueprint come into fruition. And so what we've tried to do is strategically put ourselves into the right place so make sure that we are represented on certain boards within the city within the council nhs a lot of those are crying out actually for, for community engagement on on various boards and as churches we gathered ourselves within certain themes so health and well-being safer communities young young people and families connected communities aid and employment gathered christians around those particular topics people who are working in those areas people who have a dream and a passion for those areas and so what was um, great during COVID is that we were able to kind of just see many people um, uh, just gathered to ensure that, that food bank parcels were delivered, make sure that different things happening. But what was what was beautiful pre-COVID is um, the health and wellbeing subgroup had um, gathered together. And very often in our groups, we say, what is God wanting to do? What is God doing? And how can we get on God's agenda rather than asking God to bless what we want to do, which is often our way, isn't it? Um, and so we all sensed it was it was really interesting, actually, because God had given us a few dreams we'd all had individual dreams about a light on in the dark city and realized that God was calling the churches to, to be there for people in crisis because of the suicide rate. Fortunately, we'd strategically sat on an NHS board as well, where they were also talking about crisis cafes. So being able to bring that together. And when, when I sit on these boards, I, I, 
I used to sit there thinking, you know, almost like there's all these big people with all these big titles. I'm sat there and I can say I'm representing 70 plus churches. This is the largest third sector organization in our city. So we need to have a confidence in that, don't we? And so when they say we need crisis cafes, I put my hand up and say, I think the churches could do that. <laughs> and then you hope that the churches could do that. <laughs> but like, like uh, Marvin says, you make a big offer, you make a big ask. So NHS, you know, well, the, the thing about public and private sector is that they have actually a lot less flexibility than the faith sector, but they might be able to fund something that we're able to do. So now they're able to fund um, uh, 70, 80,000 pounds a year towards the churches running crisis cafes every night of the week. And that was able to continue throughout COVID, which was amazing. 10 churches involved in this project and the money's going into the churches to keep the churches sustainable which I think is really powerful as well so there's just a real beauty in um, just galvanizing all of our resources and our energy but strategically as well and just that real sense that that's what God wants in order for his blueprint to come into fruition so um, for me it's, it's strategy and that's why our strategy is moving ahead for recovery as well. Oh, brilliant Sean thank you and God bless you and all you're doing Let's go to Andy Flanagan, sorry, Andy Frost, sorry, in uh, London. Uh, Andy? A little village called London, about 9 million people. So it's quite a big thing to think through really how we do kind of this across a big city like this. And um, But already we have 27 borough unity groups out of 32 boroughs. So there's churches that are operating in collaboration many for many, many years already. We're already doing great things week in, week out in serving very practically their communities. So the Khan's outlined nine kind of aims, nine missions post-COVID. And there are three that specifically we feel can fit around the church, one around mental health and well-being, one around community cohesion and bringing communities together, and the third one about actually providing that safety net that we're not falling through the gaps in terms of uh, poverty, uh, debt and food, those kind of things. So we began to bring together different organisations and look at different models and different practical ways about working those three things. And I've uh, been to see the bishops of London to get all their kind of confirmation of this process. And we're now in liaison with Sadiq's office to try to confirm a date with Sadiq Khan to launch this thing uh, across the capital, hoping to gather many hundreds of churches across the capital to listen to Sadiq, to see what we can do in response and to build a strategy from there. Fantastic, Andy. And let's finish with Ian in Manchester. Ian, somebody in the chat said, who was Andy referring to when he kept saying the word Ian? Um, it is you. And um, uh, how are things developing in Manchester? Well, Roger, things have come a long way since we had that conversation with Andy Burnham last year, just at the end of that first lockdown. Uh, we discussed churches and Christian organisations forming this engagement vehicle so as to be linked into strong relationships with local authorities and public sector agencies, and then to deliver relevant and coordinated action within the localities of Greater Manchester. In a sense, it's a reorientation of our place at the heart of society working together in partnership with others for justice and well-being. Well, we are now Greater Manchester Movement for Recovery. We're hosted within Greater Manchester Churches Together. We've got an enabling team who engage, who gather intelligence, who mobilize contribution. We've got borough connectors in each of our 10 boroughs who hold the key relationships there. And we're identifying theme leads to coordinate delivery within each of the shared missions that Andy was talking about earlier. So today, all over Greater Manchester, our churches and Christian organisations are operating community groceries and food pantries, providing well-being support to young people, running toddler groups and old people's clubs, standing up accommodation and support for those experiencing homelessness, establishing holiday hunger projects, assisting with digital inclusion by providing Wi-Fi connectivity in our buildings and undertaking environmental work within our neighbourhoods. We are just so pleased to be able to serve Greater Manchester in those ways.